which shouldn't be anybody. I'm Erica Deering. Um, so I decided to give this, I guess, a little seminar this morning based on some events that have happened over the past year. Um, I'm really nervous. <laughs> I've never, never done this before, so my husband pressured me. Pressure. Pressure. So, but I want to tell you, I want to start out telling you guys a little bit about me. Um, and, and about my prayer life personally. Um, not everybody was uh, raised knowing how to pray, not everybody was raised in religion or God. Um, I never had a close relationship with God when I grew up. Um, I did have parents, I did, my parents never went to church I, until I was older, my mom went, but my mother worked all the time, um, so she really couldn't go to church, but she did allow me to go to church, and she did believe in God and was a God-fearing woman. But um, she was honest. She never liked cussing, right, T? Boy, well, she'd pop you in the mouth quick. Um, and was she was a really good example of her life in her life of washing feet. She helped people all the time. Helped homeless. We did all kinds of things growing up, other than go to church. Um, so anytime somebody would invite me to a church, I would go. I went to all kinds of churches. I've been to. Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, Church of the Living God. Uh, I even went to Spanish Mass because I just thought it was really cool. Um, so I was real curious about God from an early age, and I just didn't really understand things. And then through my teen years, I really wasn't in the right frame of mind, or I guess I should say my mind was altered. I was not a very good teenager. <laughs> didn't have really good friends, and I really was down a wrong path in life. I made lots of bad choices, hung around with that bad crowd, um, and you may not know it, but I grew up in a very bad neighborhood, very bad neighborhoods in Chicago, it used to be called a, a hood rat, I still refer to myself as a hood rat a lot, because you can, you know, take me out of the hood, but you can't take the rat out of me, so. Um, so what does that mean? What does a hood rat mean? That means we were very poor, I grew up surrounded by lots of drugs, prostitution, homelessness, and crime. Lots, everywhere. My mother used to ship us off in the summer to keep us safe and out of gangs. So I grew up during my school year in Chicago, my summers in the South. So I have the extreme of both lives, which I'm grateful for. So <clears throat> we always had to live on the wrong side of town because that's all my mom could afford. My mom was a dancer on the weekends and a factory worker Monday through Friday. That was so we could have insurance. My father was a drunk. He wasn't an alcoholic. He was a useless drunk. He spent everything he could that he could get his hands on, which is why we had to live in the hood. So let's just say I'm a survivor. I'm kind of an anomaly of, uh, to my surroundings, and so is Buddy, because he comes from the same family. So we're kind of, we're the two that have made it out. Um, I had a bad start, even in my own choices, in the path that I started on. But then I met this amazing man over here. Um, and two months later, we eloped. Say that again? OK, so we met in a nightclub dancing. <laughs> and two months later, we eloped. Two months. I asked, him, I asked him to marry me. Because? Why? Oh, because I took one for the teen girls. <laughs> Somebody had to marry him. Might as well be me, right? So, now, I, I, because he was different than anybody I had ever dated before, I, mean, I knew he would keep me on a path because I had came out of rehab not too long before that, um, which... Technically, I wasn't even supposed to be drinking, I wasn't supposed to be in a bar, and I definitely wasn't supposed to be dating, but here I am. So, it worked for me. <laughs> um, so, after a year, we had a pretty rough year that first year, uh, things started to drastically change in our lives. We came to really seek and know God, we learned of His plan, and things, um, things made so much more sense to us. So, it, it, and the funny thing is, it was always there in black, white, you know, and red in some Bibles. Um, so 
we read examples in the Bible of things that we're supposed to pray for, you know, our Father that art in heaven, etc. We came to know that this is not a specific prayer to repeat, as I had learned previously in churches, but an outline, as many of you know. So, the examples of what we should pray for. So, even though I had this newfound understanding, I still felt inadequate to pray. Uh, of course, the church we went to encouraged prayer, but it made me feel lesser and stressed that the man should lead our direction. Or, that's how I felt anyway. Like the, and I met other women throughout my journey there that uh, they felt the same way. I even had one woman say to me that she didn't need to pray because her husband prayed on her behalf. Um, and that, that happened actually more than once. Um, others like me just didn't know what to say because they'd never had a relationship with their own father. So how do you talk to the number one father when you don't even know how to pray? You know, when you, you don't have that relationship, you don't know what a godly, fatherly relationship is and is supposed to be. So this led me to do a study about women and what can happen when, when, when a woman prays. <clears throat> so we read many examples in the Bible of people praying for specific things, God granting blessings, but not always, right? Sometimes his answer is, wait, not yet. And sometimes, no. No. And we don't understand why, but there's reason, right? So I want to point out a few specific women, and some of them are lesser known women in the Bible. In 1 Samuel, we learn of one woman, Hannah. I love Hannah. She was one of the two wives of Elkanah. He was a wealthy and a God-fearing man. He provided for her financially, and he adored her, the Bible said. He loved her wholeheartedly. What more could a woman want, right? Well, she was barren. She wanted a child. So she not only wanted a child, but she wanted a child that would make a difference in God's work, in, in the Lord's work, one that would ultimately deliver everyone, all of her people. That's what she wanted. That's what she prayed for. The second wife, Paniah, she'd given him children. They had tons of children. But he still favored Hannah, even though she didn't give him children yet. Oh, I thought you were telling me. Sorry. <laughs> I look up and I see Diane go like this. I'm like, is that a hand signal? What did I do? I know what it feels like. I do. That's, got it. Um, so... Paniah, she would, the Bible says she would taunt or provoke Hannah, right? She would become, so Hannah would become so sad and depressed that she wouldn't even eat. She would, or drink. She was so depressed. How do we act when we get provoked? Do you covet? Do you become jealous? Envious? Do you become cynical towards God? Those are things that many people do. Questioning why he would give a horrible person the blessings that you desire? Perhaps God intentionally brings rivals into your life to help you grow? When you look at someone that looks better, does better, has better things, loves better, drives better, um, whatever the better is, perhaps God is trying to point you toward himself so that he can bless you with the same or better. Hannah chose the path of prayer. She did not worry about flowery words. She cried out in anguish, the Bible says. At one point, she was walking along the road, mumbling, with her eyes closed. I can just imagine her just staggering, not watching where she's going, just crying out, mumbling. And Eli sees her, and he thinks she's drunk. He accuses her of being drunk. He's the high priest, by the way, Eli. And then when she looked up at him, he could see that pain in her eyes, the anguish in her eyes. And she was pouring, because she was pouring out her soul to the Lord. She was not relying on somebody special to pray for her. She wasn't relying on her husband to pray for her. She, or someone anointed, or some spiritual leader, or somebody holier than her, she was doing it herself. She went to God herself. She went to him as Hannah, a God-fearing woman, longing for a special blessing. She spoke to him in her Hannah language, from her heart. She also promised to commit her child's life to serve the Lord. And what happened? 
In 1 Samuel 1, 19, it says the Lord remembered her. Now, that doesn't mean that he forgot her before or, or that he was ignoring her in the past. I believe his answer was, wait, not yet. But after this fervent prayer from her heart, God gave her a blessing that she desired, and she named him Samuel, which means heard by God. That's what that name means. She offered him to the priesthood as she promised and was blessed with three more sons and two daughters. As I said previously, you don't need big, fancy words or a preacher or person to pray on your behalf. Come as you are and ask the Father. Use your own language. Talk to him just like you talk to anybody else. Because when women pray, God brings about new life. Another lesser known or lesser talked about woman of the Bible is one that we don't even know her name. And there are several of those. We learn about her in Luke 8 and Mark 4, Mark 5, excuse me. She's referred to as the woman with the bleeding issue. Though we know very little about her, God felt it important that we do know about her. There are several things I'd like to point out in her story. First of all, she'd been bleeding for 12 years. Can you imagine the anemia this woman had? How weak she had to be? Not only that, but she was considered unclean. And they had, I don't know if you know this, but like in those days when a woman was in that position, they had to announce that they were unclean. Nobody could touch them, nobody could So you have to walk around going, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean, so nobody touches you, right? So 12 years, can you imagine how lonely and sad she was? Nobody could touch her, no hugs, no, no just being without that. She had to be exhausted. All her resources and finances went to the doctors and said she, and instead of getting better, Luke tells us that she got worse. She had heard stories for months of this rabbi that made the lame walk, the blind to see, and she wanted to go see him as well. So, however, Jesus was there for a different reason, we read about. And a very important man and wealthy synagogue leader, and I believe his name is Jairus, I forgot, Jairus or Jairus, anybody? Um, and he was pleading with the Messiah to come and to his house to heal his dying 12-year-old daughter. 12, 12. There's a pretty good connection right there. Notice the age of the child and the length of this woman's bleeding to be the same. Just like the woman, doctors had been unable to heal his daughter. And remember, Jesus was surrounded by a group of rough characters. Fishermen, zealots, tax collector. You know, that's the worst one. <laughs> so they often kept the riffraff away from Christ. You know, a, a woman had been unclean for 12 years definitely fits that title of riffraff in their, in their day. This woman had made, was made to feel that she wasn't valuable enough, respected enough, good enough, clean enough, holy enough, feminine enough, smart enough, financially secure enough, whatever the enough, she wasn't it. She was not socially accepted. So has that happened to any of you in your life? Have you ever felt like you weren't enough? You were in a, in a situation and you just weren't enough for whatever it is, your coworkers, other around you, others around you dragging you down, um, neighbors, spouse, <coughs> For some, even your parents. Our culture has a way of making us feel small. Not just as women, people. We have a spiritual enemy in this world. He works overtime to make sure you believe that you are not enough to bring your requests to the Almighty God. Paul reminds us that in Colossians 3.12 that we are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. That's you and me. Throughout the Bible, we are told that we are the apple of God's eye, his treasured possession, cherished, loved, sought out, chosen, worth searching for, worth fighting for, and most importantly, worth dying for. Like this woman, we are to never give up 
Leviticus 15.25 explains how this woman was considered unclean. She was technically cut off from the temple and from people. She was in spiritual and social isolation for 12 years. Yet, she never gave up. She had faith. She had the faith that Jesus could save and heal her. But it was a violation for her to touch anyone, <clears throat> let alone the Messiah. So she broke several rules to get to him. It says that she accidentally touched another man, and she didn't announce that she was unclean. Ugh, right? As Yeshua walked past, she just stretched out her arm and kind of dove at him, and all she got a hold of was just the corner of his robe. That's it. Instantly, she felt the healing. In Luke 8, 45 through 48, Jesus asked, Who touched me? She fell to her knees and confessed and told her story. But did he condemn her? No, he did not. He transformed her whole identity and worth at that moment. He called her daughter. He didn't just heal her physically, but also spiritually at that moment. Our Father wants us to come to Him with our issues, even with our issues, and all. We need to be like this woman. Don't stop reaching or stretching out your hand to touch our Savior. Don't stop praying. He will look down on us and say, Daughter, your faith has healed you. When women pray, they find victory in the issues of life. Another one, in the book of Acts, we read about the miracle of Peter. There isn't a lot of focus or emphasis on this next woman, really. I had to dig. This one took me a minute. <laughs> but I want to point out something specific about her. Peter was in prison, chained to two guards and other guards at the prison door. There were church members and different leaders of the church gathered praying for Peter at the house of Mary, the mother of John. Among them was a servant named Rhoda. By her reaction, we can assume that she was also praying fervently for him. I can picture men and women of different ages crying out throughout, uh, praying on Peter's behalf. The spiritual energy in that room that they were in had to be intense and absolutely amazing, right? They, they were on the one side of the city praying. Well, Jesus, oh, Jesus, excuse me. Peter was on the other side of the city, and Christ was working a miracle. God was working a miracle, right? Got him out. Chains fell off. Wake up. Leave. Then he came to the house that Rhoda was at, knocked on the door, on the outer gate. Nobody heard it. Rhoda did. Right? She goes, she runs to the door. And she sees, um, she hears, I'm sorry, excuse me. She, was, she hears that it's Peter's voice on the other side of the gate. She was so overjoyed and so excited. She ran back and explained, Peter's at the door. Peter's at the door. The leaders thought she was delusional. They suggested it was an angel. It was Peter's angel. So the knock continued. And then they went and opened the door, and they found it was Peter. Rhoda heard Peter's knock. A lowly servant heard the knock. Nobody else. She had faith to pray for his release, faith to believe God could do something big, the presence of mind to hear the knock, right? But she, heard, she also had rec the ability to recognize Peter's voice. She even had the faith to stand up to others when they told her she was crazy and delusional. She stood up to him, no, it is Peter. But she forgot to open the door. <laughs> right? So we need to be a generation of women that do not stop at the door like Rhoda did. We not only need to have the faith to open the door, but if the door gets stuck, we need to be a generation of women who pray and are ready to kick it in. <laughs> We need to rise in the same spirit as Rhoda, ordinary women who possess Rhoda's faith, but will open the door of God's extraordinary power. That's what we need in the world today. That's what will break the chains 
that are holding us in bondage. We need to be ordinary women who are ready to embrace extraordinary lives built on prayer because when women pray, people are set free from bondage. Difficult cir circumstances are part of this life, unfortunately. We all experience trials and tribulations that touch our lives and we can expect them and even anticipate them. Sometimes, no matter how you try to prepare, unexpected things happen. This next woman is another unnamed woman. We read about her in 2 Kings 4. We just know her as, as the, sh I want to say this one more, the Shunammite woman. She's not your average woman. She was a wealthy married woman and was a very generous woman. She had no children and her husband was very old. She was able to recognize the uniqueness of Elisha and his connection to God. So she used to watch for Elisha to walk through her town regularly. And she offered him and his servant food and drink regularly. <coughs> she offered him and his, uh, I'm sorry, she, she, not only did she offer them food and drink, she offered them a place to rest after their weary walk. After convincing her husband, she added a simple room on top of her house. She used her resources to be a blessing to others. That's one thing we also need to do. She felt her home would be blessed because of the presence of God's prophet. Elisha wanted to repay her kindness with kindness. So he asked her what she would need. And she responded like a lot of us do. I'm good. I have everything I need. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Right? So... She was satisfied, I mean, technically, she, te she was satisfied with the blessings that she had in her life currently. But she was still that, that little yearning, and God knew that yearning. But Elisha's servant, Gehazi, pointed out that, her, that she did have a desire to have a child, and she had no hope of achieving that desire. So Elisha went to her and told her that the, this time next year, she would hold a son in her arms. You know, she been longing for this for years. So this kind of cut her to the core because she could not believe what he said and told her and she begged him to please not be misleading her, not to give her false hope. A hope that had been long buried. She gave up on that. But she had that son as promised. And years later, he had grown older. He was in the fields with his father and he told him that his head hurt. So instead of showing concern, his father just sent him with the servant back to his mother. She could see it was serious and sat on her knees and watched her son die. His promised son died. Did she just give up? She did not. She went up and placed him on the bed of the man of God. But the Shumamite woman did not give up still, not even just putting him on the bed. She, her, her husband questioned her. He was, probably thought he was, she was nuts too, right? She immediately ran about Carmel to find Elisha. And when she got within reach, she dropped and she grabbed his feet and she wouldn't let go. And his servant tried to push her away. <laughs> Elisha could see the deep distress. And she reminded him that, he, that she told him not to deceive her about this wonderful blessing. Not to lie to her, not to give her that false hope. But here it is, her child is dead. So she told him in verse 30, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. She was going to stay there holding his aunt legs. She wasn't going to let him go. As he made that promise to her. Can I help you, son? Okay. Because <laughs> Opal wasn't in his normal spot. <laughs> <laughs> he then got up to follow her. And once Elijah arrived at her home, he went to the room and he closed the door and he prayed to the Lord. He laid on the child, and the Bible says mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and his flesh became warm. Miraculously, the child sneezed seven times. Why? Seven's a great number, right? And then he opened his eyes. 
Elisha called to the Shimonite woman and told her to pick up her son. She once again fell to Elisha's feet and bowed to the ground, picked up her son and went out. You see, she made space for God in her life. That's one of the things we need to do. Sometimes we don't make room for God. We fill our day with work, making calls, completing projects, hobbies, binge watching TV, giving to our family until we don't leave any space or time for ourselves to give to God. God is not a pushy salesman. He's not going to come and force his way into your life and into your homes. We have to allow him to come in. He will wait until you offer him some space to work, and then he will work. If you want to see God work in your life, you need to make space for him. If you want to experience his presence and power, you need to give him some room, room, to, room to move, room to breathe. Because when women pray, even what is dead can find life again. Now let's go over the book of Ruth and talk about another woman in the Hebrew scriptures, Naomi. I have a lot to say about Naomi. <laughs> I had to reel it in. She was an Ephratite, oh, I can never say this word, Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah. She was the wife of Elimelech. <laughs> And had two sons, Malon and Chilion. <laughs> there was a famine in the land, and the family fled to Moab. Some of you may remember this story. And after a time, her husband died. That left her now a widow. And then her sons took two wives, Moabite women, not Jewish women, which was their custom. So, and it was also very frowned upon because the Moabites were not a godly people. And they went into an ungodly place so they could survive in the famine. But here we are. They married two Moabite women. After some more time passed, then her two sons died. They died before bearing children. So, in Naomi's eyes and in their family line, it's officially ended. That's it. The family line's done. She felt cursed. Now we all understand that difficult situations are part of life. We all know that trials and tribulations or tragedies will touch our lives at some point in time. You can guarantee it. It's going to happen. We live in this world. You can expect them. Anticipate them. We do our best to be prepared, but sometimes the magnitude of those situations go way beyond what we expect. A trial may seem like it goes on for several seasons. As Darla said earlier in the feast, when all those trials were happening, she just felt like they were stacking one on top of another and another and another, almost relentless. Perhaps your husband becomes injured, causing him to be unable to work. Without that income, money becomes very tight. He even runs out. The debt builds up and things will seem insurmountable. You may have a son serving in the military combat zone. There's been an attack on his platoon, and there's a knock at your door. Your son won't be coming home. That's the worst news a mother can hear. It may seem like anything that can go wrong goes wrong. Life will never be the same. It's easy to fall into a trap of thinking God has forgotten you that you've come under a curse and will never recover. When reading the story of Naomi in the book of Ruth, this is exactly how I imagined she felt. Helpless. Here she was, a widow, and now mourning her two sons. By the way, this didn't all happen at one time. This wasn't like, bam, husband, bam, sons. This was a season, this was over time. Potentially maybe around 10 years. So this trial just kept going and going for her. I believe that she felt helpless and defeated. Kind of like Job. Anybody who knows me knows Job is my favorite book in the Bible. Michael will tell you that a thousand times. There's actually several parallels to Job and Naomi. Kind of like Job, they were, they were, um, he went from being wealthy and having all that he needed and desired to losing everything, 
everything. All his livestock, his health, his wealth, his family. Talk about feeling cursed. Bless you. <laughs> Perhaps you have felt that dreaded trap in your own life to where you're just defeated. I know that's how Naomi felt. So we decided to go back to her home. So she decided to go back to her home and live the remainder of her life alone. Back then, it was not unusual for a man to marry his brother's widow. And actually, I found that in some cultures, that still is a practice today. Naomi pointed out to Orpa, Orpa, I want to say Oprah, but it's Orpa, and Ruth, that she did not have any other heirs to carry on her family. She pointed it out to them. She told her daughters along to go back to Moab and go with their family and find husbands and live their lives. She told the two young women that the Lord has gone out against me. That's how she felt. The Lord's gone out against her. She insisted that they go back to their families. Her one daughter-in-law, Orba, followed that advice, although she did well. She did weep, sorry. But not Ruth. Ruth loved her mother-in-law and said she would not leave her side. She said, where you go, I go. That tells you that Naomi must have been a very loving mother-in-law. And she had to be a good example of a godly woman, even though it doesn't really tell us that in the scriptures, because Ruth comes from, she's a Moab, an ungodly culture. So where did she learn that godly behavior? It had to be from her mother. She was a role model to Ruth, and Ruth had embraced the faith of Naomi. Even though Naomi had some bitterness about her, she even wanted to change her name to Mara, which means bitterness in Hebrew, because she felt bitter. She felt self-pity. She temporarily lost her identity. She allowed her heart to become bitter and lost her value as a child of God. It's easy to compare ourselves to others when we fall in tough times. It's easy to think that no one has it as bad as I do. It's counterproductive. And it can suck you into a pit of depression and even make you feel overwhelmed. In Hebrews 12, God tells us to not fall short of his grace and that no bitter roots, I'm sorry, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. It's easy to become consumed by bitterness, to blame others, and even to blame God. That's what Naomi felt when she said, the Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi allowed bitterness to take root inside her, and it almost brought her down. Almost. Sometimes we forget to take the effort to pray to God and ask him to lift you up or reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ. My sisters, far more can be done by falling on our knees in prayer and reaching out to each other. Prayer together is, a, is very mighty indeed. So what happened with Naomi? Her story starts out depressing, really. It's a very depressing story. But there are more chapters of her life recorded a little further in the book. Just like you and me, our story is still, her story was still being written, just like our story is still being written. There's more story to your story. Naomi still had more story. Oh, I said that twice, sorry. Although she was not happy that her sons married Moabite women rather than Jewish women, the fact that they had no kids prior to their deaths also meant her bloodline ended with her, like I said. And that included her property rights. So when she goes back home, she has no property rights because she has no husband and no children. The fact that they had no kids prior to their deaths also meant that, that their entire bloodline was done. And um, so this is someone, oh, I'm sorry. Her only hope was a kinsman redeemer. I had never heard that term you know, um, until, you know, studying the Bible years ago. And that is someone in an extended family who can step in as a replacement husband. So it has to be family, but they can step in. This could continue the family line. So that happened with Naomi's relative bullets. 
Ruth found favor in his eyes, and they were married. Ruth had a child, and Naomi found hope again. She would not live in destitute. Her neighbors pointed out in Ruth 4, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. She loved, Ruth loved her so much that it was better than her having seven sons is what they said. That's what they felt. And they were right. They could see that her daughter-in-law Ruth loved her dearly and was better than having seven sons. As with Sarah, none of Naomi's prayers are recorded in scripture. It doesn't really tell us that she was praying. We can infer it. It had to have happened because of Ruth. But God knew the desires of her heart. She was clearly a good example for Ruth. After all, Ruth came from an ungodly culture. She learned it from somewhere. So in the end, Naomi's family line continued. Ruth was the grandmother of King David, which means Naomi was his great grandmother. Naomi was legally part of our lineage to our Savior. Not only was she blessed when her family lineage was restored, but all the people in the world have been blessed through her as well. You never know what God has in mind for you. You may go through trials so you can be an instrument that God is honing and shaping to be used to produce a blessing unlike anyone in your family or community has ever seen. Because when women pray, Curses can be turned to blessings. Like a quilt, women are like varied fabrics. We're not all the same. We're not all made from the same stone or cloth. Well, they call it monolithic. You know, so we're not made all the same, so to speak. These women I spoke about are from different eras in history. Each of these women are unique. They have different ethnic influences, experiences, and various ranges of influence. In spite of their differences, they are bound by a thread of faith and prayer. There's a common power in their stories and prayers. Please don't forsake your own uniqueness and think that you must live up to what others' expectations are. Our faith does not have to be uniform. Instead, my sisters in Christ, walk your path. Have your say. Follow your dream. You can raise children or not. Marry or stay a spinster. Old term. Get a doctorate degree or a high school dropout. Work or stay home. We don't have to be synthetically produced to be a force to be reckoned with. We are each a designer's original with endless potential. This world can be cold, and often very lonely. The Father will use your journey as a source of warmth and comfort. There will be people in your life that doubt and underestimate your worth and value. Rest in the faithfulness of his word and resist those limitations pressed upon you. Your descendants will be influenced by the glimpse of your life, your story, and your example for generations to come. We all stem from these amazing biblical women that I talked about. They are our great, 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 great grandmothers of faith. God says, look, you see only a tenth of what I have for you. There are, so there's nine tenths you're not seeing, and you don't know anything about. Nine tenths of it, we don't know anything about. We don't know what he's got in store for us. Let's not forget that God wants us to make ourselves ourselves. That was very Southern. Ourselves <laughs> available to him. All these women that I spoke of are examples of not just anguish, but faith and courage. A reminder that when life gets tough and things seem like they are crashing down, be like Hannah, be like Ruth, be like Naomi, or many of the other women that God tells us about. Don't lose faith. He has begun a good work, and he will guide you through just like he did them. Also, 
Don't forget that answers are not always instant. Sometimes it can take years. Look at Sarah, Hannah, Naomi, years before their prayers were answered. They were answered. In 1 Peter, we read about we read this about Satan. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan and his forces are part of this world. They're present. He doesn't like it when we have a connection with the Father, does he? Not at all. He's unrelenting in his desire for our destruction. He doesn't want to be an, he doesn't want to just be an obstacle. He wants to destroy you and you and you and you, all of us. Destroy us. We have the ability and the opportunity to be in direct communication with the Great One who has already conquered that adversary, our enemy, Satan. Satan cannot do more than God will allow. We've read that over and over, especially in Job. <laughs> but we, you have to be connected to God. You have to be connected. God always knows our desire. He knows our worth. He knows what we need. And he guides and directs our steps. As long as we don't lose faith and allow him, as long as we don't lose faith and we allow him to direct us. In 1 John 5, we read about having confidence and compassion in prayer. More specifically, it states, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions and we have that, that we have asked of him. Follow the example of Yeshua the Christ. Have you come to a place in your life where you can say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done? No matter how difficult a task, how much it hurts, how high the mountain you've been given to climb, it doesn't make any difference. Dear Lord, I am willing. That's how we have to be. I want to tell you a little bit of examples. We have a, you've heard us talk about our ladies' prayer chain that we have. There's, what, 16 of us on there now? Anybody who wants to be on? 16 or 17. A lot of requests coming in. Yeah. Good. Then we'll make a new group. We'll add to the group. Ladies praying for the men. Ladies praying for each other. Ladies lifting up each other. That prayer chain has been a lifeline for many. Right? So, some examples of things that we've prayed for. Roger and Darla, look what happened. That was an immediate prayer. He sent it out. Answers. An angel sent. We had a little girl we were praying for, Tabitha. Many of you knew this little girl. She, she almost died. She was a newborn baby. We prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. She's not 100% healed, but she's better. She's home. She's out of the hospital. And she's with our family. We prayed for the church building that we rented in Paducah. We couldn't find a place to meet. We prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And we found a wonderful place downstairs from a Sunday church. And they're wonderful people. We, we, we sometimes will visit their church and they sometimes will visit ours. But that's what can happen, my sisters. Prayer. So now... I want to open it up. There's many other examples of women in the Bible. You can give an example in your own life. You can give an example. I was going to have you talk about women that pray that you know that are like the woman that is on the and you pray to them. Who knows? Yes. Oh, yeah, you should mention Yes, that. I should. Okay. You know, I had that in my notes. I don't know what happened to that. You're right. I did have that. I could have talked about it yesterday. Sorry. Okay. Untouchable, unclean women. We know untouchable, unclean women in our lives. They're the widows in India. When you become a widow, you are cursed. They, you have to deprive yourself. You can only have one meal a day. Nobody can touch you. Your shadow cannot even go in their wood footsteps. When somebody's walking, if they walk through your shadow, they feel like you've cursed them. They're totally untouchable. 
But let me tell you, these women pray. When we were over in India, you would hear early in the morning, murmurs. Michael. Bernard. And we're like, they're praying. They're not just praying for their own. In fact, I hardly ever heard them pray for themselves. They're always praying for others, to lift other people up. Always. These women would pray for hours, crying, tears, puddles of tears on the floor. Their hair would be wet from sitting in their tears. These were untouchable women, and they're praying for others, for our blessings, to help us, not for themselves. That's kind of how we need to be. We need to pray for others. We need to lift others up. That's how we can survive and thrive in God's word. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Comments? Testimonies? I want to hear them.
It don't matter. Go on. Okay. Uh, a few years ago, we were, um, it was during a family winter weekend, and our family didn't go, but Amanda went. Amanda went. And during church services, my dad was leading songs, and well, long story short, he ended up, um, he had a brain bleed. And uh, while Patrick and Leanne were there, they were offering medical assistance and advice, calling ambulances. During that whole process, um, I called Amanda and sent out an urgent prayer request to the winter family weekend. Oh, those of us that were there in the situation, obviously were praying. I remember those. And uh, Amanda sent that wor back word that the entire um, winter family weekend group had been given word and were praying. When we went to the hospital, um, the doctor looked and evaluated. Um, he was still talking. He should have been in, pretty, in a coma. So the doctors didn't think there was anything wrong. And I know for a fact that me and Rita prayed continually for intervention in the situation. The doctors were getting ready to send him home. And um, just through prayer and intervention, Patrick had stepped in. Uh, I don't know what convinced the doctors that we, yeah, I said, this, you don't understand. The only thing he had was he was talking a little slow and a headache. And he appeared, he had been at work the day before this happened. And we had to tell the doctors, this is not my dad. There's something going on. So for what, however the intervention took place, they did go and examine him closer. And then the chaos began. They were in a bad, we gotta do something now. They told my mom, they didn't understand how he was even alive. He had a 3% chance mm -hmm. of even surviving this. The entire particular congregation had assembled in the lobby that, you know, not the entire, most of them, praying for him. And um, he came out of the surgery in the recovery room and he woke up and was talking. Did you say what he had? Just the, the brain bleed. Right. I didn't right. say brain Right, the brain bleed. They had a pretty big, and massive brain bleed. Massive brain, brain bleed. Well, um, when the attendant or doctor, whoever it was, came out to tell us the word, when I saw them walk through the door, they were just like, they were shaking their head. And they said, um, they recognized our faith and what had just happened because not only was he talking and asking to see us, but they said, he should be on a respirator in a right. coma. I'm a neuron nurse, and that's what that's what we do. When they come right. out of brain bleeds like that, they're an ICU on a respirator on a vent. They're not conscious, and we have to keep them sedated for days. It's all he was talking. Yeah, it's all a fault. Instantly. But the doctor or the medical person that came out gave credit to the power of prayer and what we had done, because that's the only way that could have, and God, yeah, God, yeah, God. They actually said that. Yeah. Didn't they ask who the pastor was? Oh, yeah, they called him the Miracle Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say that. I was waiting for you to finish. I was going to say because they called him the Miracle Man. I remember that wholeheartedly. Um, okay, most of you may be here because you are generational churchgoers, which means you are probably here because of praying mothers and praying grandmothers that got saved. I did not have that. I did not have the privilege of that. Like, my parents were not religious, even though we knew we were not supposed to mow grass and blow the deck of cards on Sunday. That's the biggest case. Mm -hmm. However, 
be heard. But you know what? Thank God he hears us. We've had prayers answered here this year, not just our testimony. There was some that Erin won't even want to know she can talk about that were answered the day I was up there praying. And it's not bragging. It's because of everybody praying in agreement and understanding. We don't always have to know. We have to have faith that he knows. But I couldn't be where I'm at now spiritually or in my walk if it had not been for the group of ladies praying for me constantly. How I knew it may seem to some. It's important to my sister's self. It's important to me. Mm-hmm. And prayer can move mountains because it creates faith and it helps us keep our hope that we can get through this. We can keep pushing through this. Erica just told you her struggle from her childhood. I can identify with that. I told her, we're from the streets. We raised ourselves. Yep. <laughs> and it's hard. And you know, I used to get jealous when I see a little girl walking with her daddy. He holding her hand. He protecting her. And I'm like, was I so broken yep. from birth that you couldn't give me that? But I had to understand it was for me to be able to help someone else somewhere to let them know there's faith and there's hope. And that I can help. Even maybe you, older guys, may have children 50, 60 years old that are running them up. There's still hope for them. Yes. Don't give up praying on them or for them. Because God never gives up on us. And I'm grateful for that. So I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Miss Mary White over here. Oh, I'm sorry. You go first. You go first. You're closer to you. And then we'll get Mary. I'm like a baby. Speaker. You got to talk into it. I'm like a baby goat, so I might pass out. We'll catch you, girl. Okay, Nancy, the haters. I have Caitlin. A little bit like your story. I'll make it really short. Caitlin was two and a half years old, and we almost lost her. A lot built up to it. Um, she ended up having a bleeding disorder. So the night that she was saved, it was through the power of so Caitlin bled out. She'd been in the hospital for three days. She was so unstable that she couldn't be life flighted to Vanderbilt or Jose. Doctors all over the country were examining her case. She had had multiple blood transfusions, plasma transfusions, everything. So the doctor, Dr. Carlos, came into me and he said, There's nothing else we can do. Call in your family. I am so sorry. This is it. So, before the days of cell phones, <laughs> so I Steve had stepped out for a minute because Kirsten and Kelsey could actually stay home by themselves for just a little bit. She was two and a half. Caitlin was. So, we've been here for two years. Had just started going to church. I called Wendell Yuri and I said, This is what's going on. Please pray. And then I called neighbor. It was on a Wednesday night. So I called her. She went to the Methodist Church in Paducah. Wednesday night Bible study, 7 o'clock. <laughs> so I called her. So that is all I did. Steve came. This is all we could do. It was, it was a long night. She made it through. But I had somebody who come visit me at 10 o'clock the next day. I did not know what happened that night. But Caitlin made it through the night. And it was a miracle to us that she made it through the night. The doctor came in. So he told me what he did. So multiple doctors throughout the hospital. I don't know if anybody knows Dr. Carlos. So he came in and he said, I went home at 10 o'clock, got the kids out of bed, the wife, we all sit down and pray. Mm -hmm. So this minister that I don't even know, but what happened that night in the city of Paducah? Because not only did some members of our church, but other members in Paducah, he said, she went to her church and told them what was going on. People got up and dispersed. Almost every church in Paducah, a lot of them in McCracken County, they started a prayer chain. And some churches set up all night long and prayed for Caitlin, who they didn't know. So Caitlin is actually a product of prayer because she had had all the blood transfusions. She had everything that could possibly be done. The next day, she made it through the night. Um, IT, she had ITP, but she ended up getting an immunoglobulin transfusion, which we got approved for her. But at that time, it was only given to okay. HIV patients. So we had to get it approved for her because she was so young. And so she got that transfusion the next day. 
Did she have health issues for years? Yes, it took a long time before her blood counts and her white blood cell was the same. But she should have. But she's fine. She's 27 years old. She's had little health issues, but she's alive. She's here. So her, her senior project was I am a product of prayer.
intensive prayer was one of patience. Um, as some of you know, um, we, me and Darren, tried for years and years, and we're blessed 17 years after we were married with this beautiful, wonderful, <laughs> lovely daughter. We had always wanted, I don't know, six kids, but I thank God blessed me with the equivalent in many ways. <laughs> Yeah. 
just in a way that he knew something that they didn't. And so um, I know a lot of people, like when they pray for someone, and there's like 100 people praying for someone. Like we had an instance um, in a church I went to where someone's 12 year old son died. And um, everyone was really sad. And there's a whole lot of people praying for him. But we look at it from our perspective because we're like, we're all like on earth, you know, we're like these physical beings and like, oh, it's a bad thing to die. But we're all spiritual beings just in a physical body, you know, so it doesn't stop when we die. And sometimes that is the best situation, we just don't know it. It's like, his will. It's his right. will be done. He knows. Right. Like he, that's what I had said. Like he, just because we don't feel like the prayer is answered. Exactly. Does, it, it may not be answered the way we think it should be answered or the way we expect it to be answered, but it's the way that is best. Right. Well, as in um, Hezekiah, you know, the prophet came and told him he was going to die. And uh, he prayed and he wanted to live. And so God gave him, I don't remember, like 15 more years or something. And in that time, you know, his son was born, which became the most evil king. Um, so God did hear him and let him live longer, but God had a reason that he told him that he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And so I just think those situations happen um, that we don't understand, but God is always here and answers the prayer. He always remembers. Yeah. He doesn't forget us. Oh, T.T., you go first. You have it first. So, if I know me, I'm T.T., the amazing cook. <laughs> <laughs> and humble. And very humble. Uh, I always made it hot. Yes. I just don't come back. No matter what. Mm -hmm. So, just like my mom, I grew up in Chicago with us. I moved a lot. I had known this faith as well, 
the archers were right there to this, to this whole thing. And uh, he came out of us. They had to tear uh, two surgeries. One uh, doctor was working on his lungs. They pulled all the, the lining off the lungs in order to clean out his, you know, mm -hmm. his chest cavity. And half of his colon was removed. And he made, made it through that. And when he told me he was released from the ICU, and I mean, this was for many, many prayers, I'm sure. And friends of ours that had members of the church in other countries were praying for him. And uh, when he was removed into a uh, room, finally after all this, doctors and nurses from that hospital and from other areas were coming in just to look at him. And they said, you know, nobody lives with what happened to you. Wow. This was an answer to prayer. Nice. Yeah. And he's going to be doing the sermon today. Yeah, he is. I'm just going to say that. I'm going to say he's going to be our speaker today. If anybody gets it now. Amen. 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 That's awesome. Anyone else? Wes? I have some gifts to give out, too, so. Um, I just want to reiterate on the Tabitha situation that you guys have been praying for. Um, their family was one of the families that swan and Noah when the hurricane hit. They were rescued off a roof. Oh, that's right. And then her dad chartered, well, got with some friends that he had, they chartered a helicopter and started flying people in and out to find supplies in. And they were got their family down to Georgia last time. They, they just keep all that area in prayer. Okay. Thank you, everybody. That's very inspiring, very wonderful. I hope I didn't screw this up too bad. <laughs> That's my first time speaking, so I was really nervous and shaky. So, thank you. Yes, you can stop recording, please. Take another number. 